It is so great to see you. I, unfortunately, I'm sort of in the spotlight and I don't see as well as hopefully you see. But uh, it is so great to have all of you here today. Thank you so much for coming. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be looking at some verses at the end of chapter 1 and into chapter 2. There are some distinctives about these two chapters that we need to think about. The first chapter of Genesis is really kind of an overview. It gives an overview of how God created everything out of nothing in six days. Then chapter two kind of has some flashbacks that goes back and explains some of the individual parts of creation. So you, you'll be aware of that as we look at these two chapters. I'm so happy to be here today to look at our study of friendship. Now we all have needs and wants in the area of friendship. And if I were to go around and ask each one of you, which I'd love to be able to do, what your stories are regarding friendship, I'm sure I would get a variety of different stories. You might have some really good, warm stories that just warm the heart. You might have some eh, so-so stories. You might have a couple of not-so-good stories at all. I've got a couple of those, too. But we all have stories, don't we? And I'd like to tell you just a little bit of a part of one of my story, and that happened when we came here 30 years ago. We came here in January of 1986. So it was 30 years and about nine months ago. We've been here a long time. Some of you haven't been alive that long or were just tiny babies when we came. But we have been here a long, long time. When my husband and I moved here, we were also looking forward to celebrating our anniversary because our anniversary is in January. We were celebrating our 23rd anniversary. But our move here was our 20th move. So we had moved 20 times in 23 years. Now, you may not have a story like that. I hope you haven't had a story like that. But obviously, we've stayed here a long, 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 long time. So sometimes our friendships are kind of short and sweet. Other times they may grow and be longer. And hopefully you have some stories in that regard. But we all have a need for friendship. But why is it so important to us? Why do we have this? And what really is the reason for friendship being so important to us? I know when I came here, and I was invited here by the woman who was actually teaching the Bible at the Bible study at the time, and I was delighted to come. But I remember when I came thinking, boy, I hope there's somebody there that I can connect with. I hope there's somebody that will see me and realize that, that I need some friends. Because I was starting all over again. We'd left both of our sons on the West Coast, one in the military, one in, the, uh, in college. And so we were coming here, just the two of us, and didn't really know anybody. And I remember thinking, oh, I certainly hope that there's somebody that I can make friends with. I need to make new friends. And some of you are probably here today with that very same feeling. And that's a good thing. But we want to think a little bit about where this came from. Why is friendship so important to us? Is it our idea? Are we the ones that, uh, that need and want friendship so badly? Do we look out on our world and think, well, everybody else, I'm sure, has friends. I'm the only one I know that doesn't have friends. I better do something because I, I really need some friends. Is it your idea? How about your parents? Was it their idea? Maybe your mom was great at uh, having those little uh, times when you could interact with other kids. She had some play dates for you. Or maybe they sent you to preschool so that you could build your socialization skills. Your parents, they might have been involved too. But ultimately, Scripture tells us that it goes clear back to God. The Bible, in fact, teaches us that God initiated this innate desire for relationship, and we're really incomplete without it. And so we're going to go back to the beginning, and we're going to look at how God initially started this whole thing and why it is so important to us. We're going to look, first of all, at the fact that God created Adam. Adam was the name of the first man, and God created him. And we learn in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 that he created him in a very special way. So let's look at those two verses, the end of the chapter of, uh, first chapter of Genesis. Then God said, he'd been creating, created all the things that were currently th there. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, 
and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God created Adam in his own image. All right, now what in the world does that mean? God is not a physical being, right? And so it doesn't mean that we look like him physically, but he created us as a relational being because God is a relational being. You notice it said, let us. That's plural, right? And the very first verse in Genesis, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word for God is Elohim, which is a plural word. And so God is a plurality. And we know through the rest of the Bible that teaches that God is Father, He is Son, He is Holy Spirit. So there is community, there is relationship right in the Godhead Himself. And so God is a relational being, and He created us in His image, not as a physical being, but as a relational being as He is. We need, we desire relationship with Him as well as with each other. Some other things that might be part of this image of God that God gave to us. God is creative, and he reasons. He has reason. That was given to mankind in creation. God also makes value judgments. Throughout the first chapter of Genesis, when he created something, it said, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And we're going to see, oh, and it was not good in a little bit. So God has the ability to make value judgments, and he gave that to us. And so in creation, we were created from Adam on, in God's own image, but it mentioned that Adam was alone. He was created uniquely, but he was alone. If we look back at uh, verse 20, it says, And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the, of the sky. Then in verse 24, And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. So God brought all of the other creatures into being more or less just by speaking it, right? He said, let there be, and it was so. But not with Adam. With Adam, it was different. And this is, again, we are going to see in a flashback. In 2 verse 7, it says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And so man's creation was very unique, right? It was very different. He was created in God's image, and God did it. He formed it and then breathed into him the breath of life. But there was no BFF. Nobody in all the other creatures were like Adam. In fact, God brought all the other creatures to Adam and let Adam give them names, but there was nobody like him. And so God said it was not good for Adam to be alone. Now this word good doesn't mean the opposite of evil, you know, good and evil. doesn't mean that. What it means is it conforms to God's design and plan and will. So when it conforms to God's plan and will, then that is good. And God had a plan for good. And his plan for good was that he would make a suitable partner for Adam. 2.18 says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, I don't know about you, but that word helper may, you know, may have some negative connotations, although really the word helper means help as opposite him. The idea being that we are alike and yet different. The woman and the man were alike and yet different. And the reason for that was to complement and to complete each other. Have you ever heard the old saying, if two people are exactly alike, one of them isn't necessary? That's kind of the idea here. God made man and woman alike but yet different, because they could complement, they could complete each other. And Adam has kind of an interesting response. You know, Cheryl told us last week that our correct response to friendship should be, ah, there you are. Not, oh, look at me and all my needs, but ah, how good to see you. And this was really the response 
that Adam did. Now, when we read this, we think, oh, it sounds a little clinical, you know. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That, it doesn't sound real romantic, does it? But actually, I am not a Hebrew scholar, but I have read some things on this, and this is actually poetic in the Hebrew language. And this was saying, ah, somebody like me. I've looked through all the animals, there's nobody else, but finally, here's one that goes with me. And so here's Adam's response of delight. Ah, there you are. But God said it wasn't good for Adam to be alone, and so he needed to do something about it, and he decided to create Eve. Eve also was created in God's own image. She was made from Adam and for Adam. In chapter 2, verses 21 to 23, we read, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So God has very intentionally made one specially for Adam, whom he called Eve. God took a rib from Adam, and he made a woman for Adam. So this was God's ultimate purpose and design. She also was part of God's image. We see that in verse 27 of 1, when the Lord said that, 27, excuse me, that both were created in God's image. So we are totally equal with men. We are made in God's image, taken from Adam, made for Adam. And God's purpose was to make Eve as Adam's helper. Now again, this word helper uh, may have some kind of negative s suggestions. You know, why can't he be my helper? You know, I need a helper. Who's going to be a helper for me? But this word helper in Hebrew really is not a negative term at all. In fact, the same term is also used for God. In Psalm 118.7, the Lord is with me. He is my helper. Look in triumph on my enemies. I look in triumph on my enemies. So this is not a negative term at all. It's rather a term of, of completion. And so God's plan for meaningful relationship is now complete. And that's why he said in verse 31 of chapter 1, God saw all that he made and it was very good. So God's plan for a meaningful human relationship is now complete. There's the man there's the woman. But, obviously, the marriage relationship has some exclusive characteristics that are not part of other friendships. But I think that the expression here in Adam and Eve's creation really can be a pro prototype for us as we look at other kinds of relationships because they also demonstrate the fact that God created us with an innate desire for relationship with him and with others, and we are incomplete without it. And so relationship is really part of our DNA. It expresses the fact that we were created in God's image. We are like him because that's how he created us, and we are relational because that is how he is. So this is nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to feel guilty about. The fact that we desire relationship with other people is a good thing. That's the way God created us. That's the way he wants us to be. Last week in in Cheryl's comments and then also in our work that we did in our study guide, we looked at some of the illustrations of Jesus and how he really lived out this relational aspect of his character. And we saw some interesting examples of how he related to people, particularly people in need. And we want to do a little bit more of that today. But when I was um, looking at this, I wanted to have kind of a definition for friendship. And as I was looking for a definition, I actually found a number of synonyms. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And some of the synonyms that were mentioned were buddy or pal, companion, acquaintance, associate, colleague, supporter, helper. And I thought, well, you know, that's kind of interesting. This is some of the different faces on friendship, right? There are times when what we really want and need is a buddy, is a pal, somebody to hang with, somebody just to have a good time with. But other times, uh, we need somebody as an associate or a colleague who will kind of work beside us, 
as Lorene mentioned, I was involved in leading the women's Bible study for a number of years. I had wonderful colleagues and associates that, that did most of the work. We need that in different relationships. Then sometimes we need a supporter or a helper, someone to come in alongside and do things for us when we're just in great need of help. And so friendship really does have different faces on it. And I got to thinking that it might really be interesting for us to think about which of these friends' synonyms best describe us as we relate to our closer friends? What kind of a friend are you? Are you a buddy? Are you a pal? It's a good thing. Nothing wrong with that. Are you more of an associate or a colleague? Maybe you're a helper. Maybe you're a supporter. What, uh, what do you feel most comfortable? Which role is most comfortable for you in your friendships? And then on the other hand, flipping it on the other way, which ones are most important for you to receive from the friends in your life? Because I think Occasionally, when we're disappointed in friendship, it's because we're looking for something and she's given us something else back. And so it's kind of like um, Dr. Jerry, uh, Gary Chapman when he talked about the love languages, the five different love languages. Many times we try to love other people with our love language, but that's not theirs. And so it doesn't minister to them the way that we want it to. So we need to think about what our needs are in friendship, what we're looking for in a friend, and then how we project our friendship to other people. Well, last week in our study, we looked at three accounts of Jesus reaching out to people who had physical needs and healing them. And I want us to look at a couple more because I think uh, I want us to pull out just a few more things about how Jesus lived out his friendship. And he did it in two ways that I'm going to we'll look at today. First of all, he did it in actions, and he also did it in words. The first one example that I want us to look at is what we refer to as feeding the 5,000. This actually is recorded in all four of the Gospels, which is unusual. Very few things are recorded in all four Gospels. So this must have been a very important thing that all of the authors thought was, were, was worth mentioning. And so this appears in all of the Gospels. The context here is Jesus is very tired and he's very hungry from heavy, heavy ministry as well as his disciples. And so he says to them, let's go off by ourselves. Let's go to a remote place, be quiet, and rest. They all agree. So they get into a boat. They start out across the Sea of Galilee. But the, the people that he's been ministering to become aware of this. And so they decide to follow on. And so they run ahead. And when he gets to where he's going, to this remote place, voila, there's already people there wanting, to, wanting his ministry. Now, his re response is interesting to me. I think I would have been kind of miffed. You know, how in the world could this happen? I'm trying to get away, trying to have a little quiet time here. But he says that, the scripture says that he had compassion on them. And he began teaching them, and he began healing again. And they, they did that throughout the day. Finally, late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, you've got to send these people away. We're in a remote place here. They need to go off and find food and lodging in some of the other villages around. You need to send them away. But Jesus' response was, he said, you give them something to eat. Now this, they didn't understand at all. In fact, they started to argue with him. They said, oh, we couldn't do that. Eight months' wages wouldn't buy enough food for this number of people. There's no way we could do that. But Jesus said, have the people sit down. And when they found out what they did really have, what their resources really were, it was just five small barley loaves and a couple of fish. And they said, what in the world? How could that possibly be enough to help anybody? But Jesus said, have the people sit down. And then he gave them the food to distribute so that they could literally see how it multiplied before their eyes. And there were 12 baskets left over. A true friend helps another friend see how small her resources really are, but how God can multiply them in front of our very eyes if we're willing to do that. So we have an, one of the examples of Jesus. Another example is healing blind Bartimaeus. He was a blind beggar who was aside, uh, beside the road, and the, the crowd was coming along with Jesus. They were making a lot of noise, and, and Bartimaeus asked, what's happening? What's going on? Because he was blind. And they said, well, Jesus is coming with, some, with a crowd. And so he started screaming and hollering, Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on me. And they said, shush, shush, be quiet, be quiet. But he just cried out all the more. And when Jesus finally heard him, he said, bring 
him to me. And when he came to Jesus, Jesus asked him a question. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? Now that seems like a no-brainer, doesn't it? Surely it was obvious he was blind. Wouldn't that be the most important thing that he would want? But Jesus, when the man answered him, the man said, I want my sight. Jesus said, okay, and he restored his sight. But he wanted to find out what Bartimaeus thought was his main need. A true friend helps another friend see what her greatest needs are. Sometimes we have to learn to ask questions to find out what our friends really need. We may assume that we know what they need, but it's important for them to know what they need. So Jesus was a wonderful example in his actions of what friendship looks like. He was also a wonderful example in his words. In John 15, we have a, a quote that we are probably going to be using a number of times throughout the study because it's one of the few places where Jesus really addresses friendship. But he says to his disciples, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now here, he is giving words of instruction and affirmation. And we may not think about that so much in friendship or relationship, but this really is a strong part of friendship, is being an encourager, being an affirmer, and being an instructor. Because many times, we don't see ourselves 20-20, do we? Maybe in hindsight we see some things a little better, but we don't always see things well. And we may need somebody to come alongside and to instruct us and to affirm us. And that's what Jesus is doing for the disciples. He's telling them what true love really is and that they are his friends if they obey him and his ways. Then in verse 15, he said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. Now, this is an interesting thing to me because he's calling them friends. He's telling them, you're not just my servants, you are my friends. He's bringing them to a peer level. And he says, I'm sharing with you things that the Father has told me. Not everybody knows this, only you. You are my confidence. Only you have this message. And so he called them his friends and shared confidences with them. Is that what a friend is for? Yes, a beautiful illustration in the life of Jesus of one who is willing to be a confidant and one who is willing to share with his friends the things that are most meaningful. Well, our study guide title, Navigating Friendships, Becoming the Friend You Want to Have, states our goal for this, for this whole study, to become a friend that we would like to have, a friend like Jesus. But how are we going to do that? It's a pretty high standard, isn't it? When we look at Jesus, we don't have the abilities that Jesus did. We don't have the, the ability to heal people and so forth, literally, as he did. But what does it mean? What's it going to look like to be a friend like Jesus? Well, we have put on your sheet some application questions, and they will be there from time to time. And the purpose of these application questions are for your personal reflection. These are not things that you will talk about in your groups. These are things just for you to look at and to determine how the Lord might be speaking to you about the things that we talk in the lecture. So I encourage you Today, if possible, while it's still kind of fresh in your mind, to look at these questions and how the Lord may want to apply these messages to you, how we can be a friend like Jesus. Now, we need to be cautious. Whenever we make applications, we need to be cautious because we can be too narrow or specific from a very general purpose. For instance, the feeding of the 5,000. I don't think that is teaching us that if we have 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 people, 20,000 people out there all needing help, that we should just do whatever we need to do to meet all of their needs. I don't really believe that that's what it's, what it's saying. But I think we can see from that that Jesus has resources that he can multiply through us. We may think we're very ill-resourced to do something, but Jesus has the ability to multiply our resources in ways that we can't 
imagine. And so we need to trust him to do that. So we need to make realistic applications from these things, but then really ask the Lord to show us what he wants us to learn. In regard to uh, some of the actions that come out of this feeding the 5,000. How can you help a friend receive the resources that God's giving her to meet a need in her life and then trust him to do the multiplication? You may need to come alongside somebody and just encourage them that God has the ability to multiply the resources that she needs for her situation. How willing are you to help a friend discover what her greatest and deepest needs really are so that she can address them and be helped? We need to learn to ask good questions questions so that we can help a person understand what their real needs are. Many times we think our needs are out there. We're blaming all these situations, circumstances, people out there. That's my problem out there. Whereas really my problem is in here. And you may need as a friend to come alongside, to be a friend, to help her discover her greatest needs and difficulties. Now in the area of words. How are we able to give words of instruction and affirmation to a friend in a loving and beneficial way? And I said here, and this is for me, for sure, pray for God's grace and wisdom for help. Because sometimes we want to just tell them, don't we? Boy, I, I, there's so many people I could just straighten out. You know, if they, just, if they just came to me and asked, I could just straighten them out in no time. Do you ever feel that way? My kids, I think, feel that way. And my grandkids feel that way. <clears throat> But we need to make sure that we do it with grace and with wisdom and in, 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 God's, in God's words and God's instruction. Then, are you a faithful friend who does not break confidences? This is so important, isn't it? If you have someone in your life that shares confidential things with, with you, are you sure that you keep those confidences? And then, how do you recognize someone who can be a confident in your life and allow her to speak God's truth from her heart to yours. We all need someone in our life, someone older, someone wiser. And for me, it's hard to find somebody older. Not so hard to find people wiser, but a lot of problem finding people older. But we need to have someone in our life that can be a confidant for us, that will pray for us, that will listen to us with discernment and encourage us. Okay, these are things that we need to ask ourselves and ask the Lord to help us know what he wants us to do and be in a friend. Many of us come with a goal to find a new friend. The group that I was in last week when we went around and introduced ourselves, most of us said, we'd like to meet a new friend. That's one of the reasons why we're here. That's fine. No problem with that. That's how God made us. But hopefully in the, in the process, we'll also learn to be a better friend. For the two just really seem to work together. When I'm concerned about being a friend like Jesus, I'll also grow in friendship with others. They'll see qualities in me that they desire in a friend. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you for the example that Jesus is for us in this whole area of relationship. We need each other so much. And you have put us in places where we can develop relationships that will build and grow us. And I thank you for that. I thank you for the women in this room, the potential for friendship and for relationship, for growth and learning from each other. That's what our groups are all about. Thank you for that. And we look forward to learning more and more about Jesus, how he related to people, and the benefit that that was in the lives of others. And so help us to learn how to minister to others so that we can be your hands and feet in the world where you have put us and that you will shine through us. Thank you for the fact that you can multiply the resources that we have. They seem very small at times, but you can multiply them and you can give us the grace to be the friend and the person that you want us to be in each other's lives. And we thank you for this and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.